Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Father, what New Year's resolutions have you made this year? Going to cut down on smoking? Going to give more thought to your waistline? All right. But why not make a really important New Year's resolution? One that will mean greater happiness for your family. One that will not only carry through 1947, but for many years to come. Follow the example of so many fathers who start the New Year right by increasing their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society in January. Resolve now to give your loved ones increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Guest. This week sees the United States enter its 171st year of freedom. In those years, the country has faced many bitter struggles for survival, struggles that have included half a dozen wars. In every one of those wars, our freedom was threatened, but the combined efforts of all of our citizens brought us through to victory. Now, in 1947, it will take the combined efforts of every one of us to win another war, the war against crime. The crime wave cost the people of the United States hundreds of millions of dollars in 1946, and the cost will be increased this year unless we all, every one of us, fight the crime wave with as much concentration as if we were fighting a foreign enemy. Tonight's file opens in a small farmhouse located in a remote section of one of our eastern states. It is night. The occupants of this dwelling, Edward Gray and his wife, are sitting in front of an open fire. Edward? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Were you sleeping? Uh, I must have dozed off for a second. You want something, Louis? Well, the fire's getting kind of low. It could stand a couple of logs. Oh, oh sure. Fine, Edward, thank you. <sighs> Listen to that wind. Mm, yes. And look, there at the window. Snowing pretty hard. Mm-hmm. How about the livestock? Now, don't worry about them. They're all safe in the barn. <laughs> Good. Edward. Hmm? I, I think I hear someone outside. Listen. Yes, there is somebody. I'll go look. Put on your coat, Edward. I won't need it. 
There's someone on the steps. It's a woman. Here, let me get you inside, lady. Oh, oh thank you. Edward, what in the world? It's a woman. I found her on the steps. Good heavens, who is she? I don't know. I just had her here on the couch. Well, is she hurt? Should you get a doctor? No, doctor. Please. Let me get warm. Let me stay here. That's all I ask. She's passed out. Well, well, just don't stand there, Edward. Let's let's make her something hot to drink and put her to bed. In a large city a hundred odd miles from the isolated farmhouse. Special Agent Jim Taylor in the local FBI field office is just answering a summons from the agent in charge. Come on in, Jim. Thank you, sir. I suppose you're all set for your vacation. Yes, sir. I shove off in about three hours. You're going up near Hendersonville, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Wonderful hunting up around there. So I've heard. I'm just going to dig into those woods and stay lost for two whole weeks. Jim. Yes, sir? I hate to ask you this. You can turn me down if you want to. But as long as you're going to Hendersonville... Yes, sir. There's some extracurricular hunting you could do on the side. <laughs> I knew I should have left yesterday. Well, let me give you the story. A female inmate in the county jail near Hendersonville, who was being held on federal charges of violating the National Property Act, escaped about two hours ago. Oh, who is she, sir? Her name is Doris Parker. She was also charged with knifing another woman in a fight over a man. I see. She's evidently quite proficient with a knife. She also used one on a matron to make good her escape. Well, have we anyone on the case now? Yes, Royce Thompson, our resident agent in Hendersonville. He's working with the local and state police. Well, that's sparsely settled country up there, sir. There's not many roads. If she stays in the car, they shouldn't have too much trouble. Finding... I know. Chances are she'll be picked up before you even get there. But in case there's a hitch, Jim, why don't you drop in on the resident agent before you take that hunting trip? See if you can give him a hand. Snowman. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling? Much better, thanks. I thought you'd still be sleeping. Well, I got hungry, so I came down here and sort of helped myself to breakfast. Oh. That woman who was so nice to me last night, is she your wife? Well, Louise, yes. Isn't she around? Yes. She's in the front room there. I hope she doesn't mind my puttering around in her kitchen. Oh, she'll be glad you did. You see, well, Louise is bedridden. Oh. So you have to more or less help yourself. But she was in here last night. Oh, I carried her in. I see. Uh, look, Miss... My name is Ruth. Well, uh, Miss Ruth, I've been thinking, is there anyone you'd like for me to notify... Let them know you're here, all right. I, I, we have no phone here. There's but... no one worried about me. Oh. I suppose you're wondering what I was doing out in the storm last night. Well, yes. I'm a waitress at a hotel in Hendersonville. Got the day off, so I rented a bike. Thought I'd take a look at the country. Uh huh. Well, I rode too far. Storm came up, and I just got stuck in it. Well, I'll arrange to take you back into Hendersonville sometime today. Must you? What do you mean? I'm really not in any hurry. Edward! Edward! Uh, be right with you, Louise. Thompson? That's right. I'm Jim Taylor. Well, well, hello there, Jim. Welcome to Hendersonville. Thanks. I heard you were coming down here. Yes, this is the first day of my vacation. I heard about that, too. Oh. 
Want anything to turn up on that escape prisoner? Yeah, she hasn't been found yet, but I think you'll be out hunting real soon. How's that? Well, as you probably know, the Parker woman escaped last night from jail in the matron's car. Yes? The car was last seen on Route 45 heading toward Springdale. I see. This morning, one of the state troopers found evidence that a car had skidded off a small bridge over the Springdale River. On this same Route 45? That's right. The guardrail on the bridge was smashed, and there was a large hole in the ice where the car had evidently broken through. Have you been out there yet? Yes. Couldn't see the car, but I found a license plate on the ice nearby. It's the one we're looking for. And how about the Parker woman? Not a trace of her. You think this was a trick on her part, or is she really down there in the car? Well, we had quite a storm last night. It could be legitimate, but we'll find out soon enough. Oh, how's that? There's a diver going over there this afternoon. Well, that should tell the story. Have you checked into your hotel yet? No, I came right over here to your office. Look, why don't you go over and check in and make arrangements for your hunting trip? I've an idea that you'd be on your way this afternoon. Who's that? Me. Ruth. Oh. Do you mind having company? No. Got lonesome up there in the house. Oh, I think you'll find it kind of cold out here in the barn. I'm okay. What are you making? I'm just repairing this harrow. Oh. Hey. Hmm? You know something? What? This would be a swell place for a barn dance, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah, we've had them here plenty. What, one of them regular old-fashioned ones? Uh-huh. With an old geezer playing a fiddle? Yeah, sure. Oh. You know, when Louise was well, there was always something doing around here. Really? Sure. Picnics, sleigh rides, barn dances. Do you like to dance? I'd love to. I got it. Ed. Huh? How long has your wife been like to you? Over a year now. It's a long time. Uh, I suppose it is. I hadn't thought much about it. Does she keep on like this? I'm afraid so. The doctor says she'll never walk again. It's pretty tough. She takes it fine. Oh, I don't mean for her. I mean you. How do you figure that? Oh, look. I can see what kind of a guy you are. You like to dance, have fun. Now you're going to spend the rest of your life playing nursemaid. Oh, I don't mind that. Oh, who are you kidding, mister? Look, I... I Wait a minute. I really came out here to ask you a question. Seems like a real good time to do it. Well? I don't want to go back to Hendersonville. I'd like to stay here a while. Would you like me to? I... I gotta go do some chores. Back him in, Royce? Sure thing, Jim. Just called your hotel. Well, I've been out all afternoon picking up supplies. Oh, any report from that diver? Yes, he located the car. Oh? It's the one we're looking for, all right. How about the woman? Not a sign of her? Uh-huh. I have expected that. Well, the car door next to the driver's seat was open, Jim. She could have made an attempt to get out and been pulled downstream under the ice. Yes, I know. In that case, with the river frozen over, we might not recover the body until spring. Royce, I just have a hunch that she isn't in that river. I think she sent the car off the bridge to take the heat off. That's very possible. Is that a map of this district there on the wall? Yes, yes. I've been using it for this search. Take a look at it, huh? Sure, sure. What do all these pins here represent, Russ? Well, most of them are the uh, roadblocks that were set up right after the escape. Mm-hmm. This is Route 45, and here's the bridge. Yeah. Royce, how much snow fell out there last night? At least a foot. Some places it drifted pretty heavily. Then if she did abandon the car, she couldn't have gotten very far. No, no, not unless another car picked her up. Has a house-to-house check been made? All along the highway, yes. Anybody live back up there in the hills? Well, I'd say a dozen farmers pretty well scattered. Have they been checked? Not yet, no. Are the roads passable up there? Yes, they were plowed today. Well, Royce, why don't you mark off the exact location of those farmhouses and we'll divide them up. There's still time this evening for us to go call on them. Finish your chores? 
Yeah. I waited for you. I sort of hoped you might come back. I went for a walk. I could have gone with you. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to think. What about? You're staying here. Well. Edward? Edward? Coming, Louise. Excuse me, please. You want something, Louise? Edward, where's that girl? In the other room. Close the door, please. Sure. Something wrong? I think so, yes. What is it? I was just listening to the radio. They were playing music when the announcer interrupted the program for a news bulletin. Yeah? It told about a woman who had escaped from the jail last night. Gave a complete description of her, right down to the clothes she was wearing. Huh? Edward, that escaped convict is the woman we took in. Ruth? Yes. Well, it can't be. I tell you it is. You've got to notify the police. But Louise... The man on the radio said she's a very dangerous woman. You've got to get word to the police at once. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Get her in here. Ruth. Yes? Would you come here a minute, please? Sure. What do you want? Louise just heard something on the radio about a woman who escaped from the county jail. From the description, she, she thinks it's you. Will you please tell her you're a waitress in Hendersonville? Sure. Where are those clothes she wore last night? They're upstairs. Why? Will you go up and get them, please? What for? The escaped prisoner was wearing a prison dress. Please go get her coat. Wait a minute. You don't have to. Now, will you get the police? Maybe he doesn't want to. Maybe he wants me to stay. What? Ask him. Edward. Louise, I... She stays. From tonight's file, to which we will return in just a moment, we can see that one of the primary jobs of the FBI is to uncover the facts of a case. Armed with these, they can then take the proper measures that will inevitably lead to the solution of their problems. And the same thing is true of fathers. But instead of trying to get at the facts about his family's future, many a father lives in a sort of dream world. He refuses to ask himself this simple question. If I should die... How would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? If you really love your wife and children, don't shrug your shoulders to that question. Be fair to your family and get an answer based on facts. To help you, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. I guess you're right, Mr. Cross. That fact-facing chart is something I've been needing for a long, long time. How do I go about getting one, and how much will it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Guest. It is an established fact that honest citizens cannot mix with criminals any more than oil can mix with water. And for that reason, your FBI wishes to pass on some advice. Advice which, if heeded can save you untold misery. That advice is, do not, under any circumstances, condone the doings of a criminal. 
and by so condoning, expect that your sympathy will regenerate the criminal into a useful member of society. In dealing with criminals, reality must serve as your foundation. And reality tells you that over 50% of all persons arrested have a previous arrest record. That is not a theory, but a fact. A fact that is proven by the files of your FBI. Tonight's file continues at the farmhouse. Edward Gray is seated in the common room, gazing reflectively into the fireplace. The woman who calls herself Ruth enters. Ed. Yes, Ruth? How is she? My wife? Yeah. Is she still sore? She asked me to leave her alone. Well, that means you can be with me. Oh, please, Ruth. Oh, look. Quit worrying, will you? If you don't call the cops, there'll be no trouble. How do you know? Because they think I'm dead. Or at least they will when they find the car. What do you mean? I sent the car I was driving off a bridge. It went through the ice into the river. Oh. When they find it, they'll think I wound up in the river, too. What? Hmm? There's a car stopping outside. What? You better get into the back room. Okay. Hurry up. Just a minute. Yeah? Hello there. You Mr. Gray? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Uh Uh-huh. Well, what can I do for you? Well, you may or may not know, sir, that a woman held on federal charges escaped from the county jail over in Hendersonville last night. Uh, I hadn't heard about it. We have good reason to believe that she's still in this vicinity. I see. I have a picture of her here. Take a look at this, please. Sure. Ever seen her? No, sir. I've never seen this woman before in my life. She's a pretty tough customer. Already used a knife on two people. Stabbed them? That's right. Well. Well, if by any chance she should turn up here, I'd advise you to notify us at once, please. Uh, yes, sir. I certainly will. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Gray. Good night. Ruth. Yes. That was a man from the FBI. I know. I heard him. They seem to think that you're not dead. Yes. What do we do now? Oh, I don't know. Let me think. Edward? Yes, Louise? Stay here. I'll see what you want. What is it, Louise? Who was that? Who came to see us? Well. Tell me, Edward. It was a man from the FBI. Looking for her? Yes. What did you say to him? Answer me. I told him that she wasn't here. Oh, why did you do that? Can't you see that she's using you, playing up to you just for her own protection? Louise, she's not... I'm not turning her in. That you, Jim? Yes, right. Well, you're just in time for some hot coffee. Well, well, where'd you get it? Uh, I picked up a thermos full on the way back. You have any luck? No, no, I didn't pick up a thing. How about you? No, I didn't get anything either. Well, that's that, I guess. Oh, thanks. Boys, let me check my list for you, huh? See if I missed anyone? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Clinton? Yep. Dixon? All right. Franklin? All right. Martin? Yeah. Henderson and Dillon? Yeah. How about Gray? Oh, I wanted to ask you about him. Do you know him, Royce? Yes, uh, casually. Why? Well, when I showed him the girl's picture, he was quite positive about never having seen her before. I'm always a little suspicious of someone that certain. Ah, no, there's nothing wrong with Gray. He's lived around here for years. I know his wife, too. She's an invalid. You mean she's bedridden? Yes, yes, she has been for over a year. Royce, does anyone else live there with him? No. Are you sure? Yes, why? Come on, we're going back to Gray's farmhouse. What you want? Just wanted to talk. About me, I suppose. Yeah. What you say? It's not important, Ruth. I want to know. 
Well, Louise said I was a fool to be shielding you. You were playing up to me so I wouldn't turn you in. You don't believe that, do you? Ruth, I don't know what to believe. What do you mean? The stuff that FBI man said about you, about you stabbing people, that, that wasn't nice to That hear. was a lie. Louise told me they said that about you on the radio, too. Oh, look. She's just trying to make trouble for me. And she's going to keep on that way unless we do something about it. Huh? Oh, Ed. Ed, I've been thinking about us. Now that the cops know that I'm not dead, we can't stay on here. We've got to go away. We? Yes. But Ruth, I couldn't leave Louise. Louise? <laughs> She's a helpless cripple. She will be for the rest of her life. She's no use to you, herself, or anybody else. Don't talk that way, Ruth. Well, all of a sudden, you're sticking up for her. She's my wife. Wait a minute. You're not backing out now. Don't forget you're involved in this thing, too. You told that cop I wasn't here. But, Ruth... So you're not only leaving here with me. I'm making sure before we do that she isn't going to talk. What do you mean? I'll show you what I mean. Where are you going? In to see your wife. You come back here. All right. What? Stay where you are, both of you. Why, you... The man from the FBI. That's right. Why'd you come back? How did you know I was here? You told me yourself. What? You see, after my first visit, I learned that Mr. Gray's wife was bedridden. That made me very curious. What do you mean? I had to find out who was pacing up and down in the next room while I was at the door. Oh. Thanks for the tip-off. For her guilt in violating the Federal Escape Act and the National Stolen Property Act, Doris Parker was sentenced to 10 years in a federal penitentiary. Edward Gray was sentenced to two years in a federal penitentiary for harboring a federal prisoner. And so another file was closed by your FBI. Closed because of superior skill in the art of detection. The possession of such talent by a special agent is not a fortunate accident, but the studied result of long, hard labors. Labors which every agent undergoes as part of his training. Nothing in the training of a special agent is left to chance. Because that is not the way your FBI works. Your FBI works to eliminate chance and to substitute certainty. And that policy has paid a dividend called protection. A dividend being collected every day by the people of our country. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Souvenir Gun. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Souvenir Gun, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At the beginning of the new year, there are few fathers who don't pause to reflect on the 12 months that have gone by to make plans for the future, plans that will promote the happiness of those they love. That's why so many fathers pick January as the time to increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, the finest New Year's resolution of all is this. Resolve to give your family increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, The Souvenir Gun. It is a fact certified by history that after every war, there has been an increase in crime. It is not a fact, however, that the new criminals are a result of the practice which the Army and Navy gave our younger generation in the art of murder. The hoodlums who are swelling the files of police departments all over the country are hoodlums because of circumstances. Wartime is a period of loose morals and easy money, a set of conditions which suits the criminal to perfection. Let us, therefore, stop pointing at the armed forces and blaming them for our current troubles. Let us stop finding reasons for the crime wave and start finding cures. The night's file opens in a clearing near a small cabin located in the hill country of one of our Midwestern states. A man is standing in this clearing, firing a pistol at a string of tin cans that are propped on a fallen log. Jack! Oh, hi, Evie. What's this? Not bad, huh? No. This is that German Luger I bought from a guy. I ain't missed one of them tin cans in the last 20 shots. Why should you? You've been practicing every day for the past two weeks. That sounds like a beef. It is. What's the matter, Evie? You really want to hear it? Sure. I'm bored. Bored stiff. Well, look, sweetheart, there's no law that says you got to stick around. Oh, Jack, this has nothing to do with you and me. Well? I just can't take this way we're living. Now, look, Evie, I told you why we... I know. You had to lay low for a while, so we hole up here in the woods. But what happened to the rest of the things you told me? What do you mean? About what a big guy you were going to be. I am going to be a big guy. The biggest. That's why I'm taking my time. Don't get it. Look, Evie, I'll lay it all out for you just once more. There's lots of different ways of making a living with a gun. Mm -hmm. Up to now, everybody, even Dillinger, has always made one mistake. That's what's licked them. I ain't making that mistake. But what's that got to do with us staying up here in this broken-down place? Gives me a chance to practice and think. How much longer does it go on? I'm doing a job tomorrow. You are? Where? In town. Then we're leaving here? I am. You're not. What? This is just a small touch, sort of for practice. We don't make a big move yet. Look, Jack, I can't take much more of this. You want to call it quits? No. All right, then we do it my way. 
Now, watch me pop off that little tin can on the end. Jim Taylor? That's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Grant. Oh, hello there. Hello. I heard about you. Oh, I just in to see your agent in charge. He told me to talk to you. That's why I'll pull up a chair. Thanks. Case came into headquarters this afternoon. There's an FBI angle in it. That's why I'm here. What's it about, Sergeant? A stick-up in a building over on State Street. Yes. Messenger carrying an envelope containing money and securities was waylaid right outside his office. I see. Armed man forced him into a self-service elevator, took him down the basement, tied him up, made a clean getaway. Uh How much cash was in the envelope? A little over a thousand dollars. Well, what's our angle, Sergeant? Well, there's every indication that the robber skipped across the state line. Oh, I see. The messenger give you a description of this man? Mm-hmm. I have it here. We've already sent out an alarm on him. Good. Now, is there anything else I should know about? Yeah, we have two good leads. Oh, what are they? Well, the weapon the hold-up man used was a German Luger. Messenger knows guns. He recognizes. Another souvenir gun, I suppose. Yeah, it looks that way. We also found the messenger's envelope in a trash barrel in the basement. It was empty, of course, but there were several fingerprints on it. Can we get a set? You already have them. Oh? They're on the way to your lab right now. Swell. Sergeant, let me assemble all these facts on paper, then we'll go to work. Oh, good morning, Evie. I didn't know you were back. I got in late last night. Why didn't you wake me up? I didn't want to disturb you. Oh, I wish you had. I was worried. What about? Well, the job. How'd it go? Well, how'd you expect? Went fine. How much did you get? Oh, about a thousand in cash. Well... A few securities. I got rid of them, just kept the cash. Baby, you can pack your things. We're getting out of here? Yep, we're moving into town. Oh, wonderful. I got us a suite of rooms in a good hotel. Jack, a suite? Wait till you see it. Real class. I spent our last hundred bucks for it. Our last hundred? I thought you got a thousand on the job. I did. Well, where's the other nine hundred? I loaned it to a guy. You what? That's why I did the job. You pulled a stick up so you could loan somebody else the money? That's right. Are you out of your mind? No, no, it's like an investment. Oh, brother. Now, wait a minute. Don't blow your top, honey. The guy's coming around to the hotel to see us tonight. You'll find out then how good an investment I made. Evie? Yeah, honey? Well, you finally got out of that tub, huh? Only temporarily. Oh, after two months of bathing in that mountain stream, I'm going to live in a bathtub. <laughs> Look, honey, that guy's on his way up. Oh, you mean the one you loaned the money to? Yeah, I want you to meet him. Oh. Hey, there he is now. Come on. Will I find out why you made the investment? Mm-hmm. Just a minute. Hello, Jack. Hi, Ray. Come on in. Thanks. Ray, I'd like you to meet the wife. Honey, Ray Nelson. How do you do? Hello. Well, when this happened, Jack? Getting married? Yeah, a couple of months ago. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. Sit down. Okay. Can I fix your drink, Mr. Nelson? Uh, no, thanks. Ray, I'll tell you why I asked you to drop over. It's about that dough I loaned you. The 900? Uh-huh. Well, something's come up that sort of puts the squeeze on me. I'm going to have to take it back. What? Sorry. But you just gave it to me last night. I know. You also knew that I had to use it to pay off a guy. I ain't got it, Jack. Oh, that's bad. Well, when you gave me the dough, you said I could keep it as long as I like. I told you something's come up. Jack, I just ain't got it. Mm. Well, in that case, maybe you can pay me back another way. How do you mean? Do a job with me. What kind of a job? I know where there's a safe that's loaded with dough. It's a real soft touch. No dice. Busting safes is your business. It used to be my business. What do you mean? I retired. Them big jobs are too tough. This one's a cinch. It's a roadhouse just outside of town. I've cased the setup. I got the whole thing planned. Jack, I... I just can't do it. Is that the answer I gave you when you wanted to borrow the dough? Is it? No. Then why don't you return the favor? Okay. That's better. Evie? Yeah, honey? You make that drink now. Okay. Well, drink to a good investment. Good 
Can I come in, Jim? Yes, come ahead, Sergeant. I got your message. Ask me to drop over. Yes, we received a report on those fingerprints. The ones on the messenger's envelope? That's right. They belonged to a man named John Belmont, also known as Jack Belmont. Belmont? Mm-hmm. Never heard of him. Did he uh, have a criminal record? He's wanted by the United States Army. He deserted over two years ago. Well. We've had no report on him since. He must have been hiding out. Now that the war is over, he figured the heat was off, hmm? Probably. How did you get the report back from Washington so fast? By teletype. Oh, by the way, he deserted from this district. I see. Anything else on him? Oh, mostly routine stuff. There's one note here, however, that states he's an expert shot. Did he serve overseas? No. I wonder where he picked up the Luger. <laughs> he didn't have to go overseas to get that. No. Unfortunately, too many guns brought back as souvenirs are getting into the hands of men like Belmont. Yeah. Well, there's the story, Sergeant. But it still doesn't bring us any closer to apprehending him. That's true. One thing is certain. If he's come out of hiding, he'll undoubtedly attend another job. We've got to pick him up before he does. Okay, let's go inside. What about the car? We leave it here. Right in front of the roadhouse? I gave the doorman a fin. Tell him we didn't want to get all jammed up back in the parking lot. Oh. Let's go. Now, you know the setup. Once we're inside, we head to the manager's office. Right. It's an old safe. You should crack it in no time at all. Uh Uh-huh. Here we are. Go ahead, honey. Ray? Okay. So we head right down here past the bar. Come on. Hey, this is a real nice place. Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe we could stay a while. Yeah, that'd be great. That's the manager's office right ahead. Yeah. Either you wait here, right outside the store. Okay. We're going in. What do you want? We got something for you, mister. Huh? This. There's the safe, Ray. Uh Uh-huh. How's it look to you? Soft touch. You got the soup? Yeah, right here. How long will it take? Just a couple of minutes, but it'll be noisy. I'll cover that. You get to work. Right. Everything okay? Naturally. What do we do now? You and me are going to have a little dance. What? Come on, let's get out on the floor. Are you crazy? Come on. Well, we ain't done this in a long time, hmm? No. Let's dance over by the bandstand. Why? I want to talk to the leader. (laughs) What for? Got a request for him. Oh, Jack. Honey, fellas lead, girls follow. Oh, uh, mister? Yes? I got a request for you. I'll be glad to play it. What's the tune? Oh, no special tune, just so long as it's loud. Sorry, that's for squares. So is this. What? Don't rumble, mister. You do as I say, I'll keep the gun right under my coat. Now play loud. Beat it out, boys. Loud. Come on. Keep an eye on that door for Nelson, honey. Yeah. Can't you play any louder? More fresh, boys. Beat it out. How's that? Okay, keep it that way. Jack, the door's open. He's coming out. Well. All right, mister. Take it down. Down, boys. Keep it that way till we get out of here. <laughs> Thanks for the concert. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how the FBI brings to justice these criminals who have succeeded in pulling the wool over the eyes of honest citizens. Now, a word about men who pull the wool over their own eyes. I'm thinking particularly of many, many fathers in this country. In the back of their minds, they know there's a question they ought to ask themselves. But they keep dodging that question. They refuse to ask themselves... If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, 
well-housed and well-clothed. Please don't say to yourself, oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's pulling the wool over your eyes again. What you're after now is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, Mr. Cross, I'm ready to pull the wool off my eyes. How about telling me where to get this fact-facing chart and how much it'll cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, the souvenir gun. Because we are a nation of collectors and souvenir hunters, almost every member of the armed forces brought back something to show the folks at home. Something to identify him even more than the uniform with the specific victories in his theater of the war. Many of those souvenirs were foreign weapons. Weapons which ranged from single shot pistols to Japanese machine guns, which had been used to kill. Now, with the war over, those weapons are falling into strange hands and being used again as instruments of murder. Now, to protect yourselves, your FBI asks those of you who have possession of souvenir weapons to comply with all laws where required and have them registered, if you have not already done so. By doing that, you'll be doing your part in fighting the crime wave. Tonight's file continues. Several hours have passed since the daring roadhouse holdup. Detective Sergeant Grant is paying a late evening call at the apartment of FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor. Well, Jim, I hope I didn't wake you up. Not at all, Sergeant. I was reading. Good. What's on your mind? Well, I've just come from investigating a holdup at a roadhouse out on Route 16. Yes? Their safe was cracked open. Over $12,000 was taken. I think the man who engineered the job was our friend Jack Belmont. Really? Yes. Pretty... Clever job, too. Oh, what are the details? Well, two men entered the manager's office. Hmm. Before he could call for help, one of them slugged him with the butt of a gun. Could he describe the men? Just sketchily, but he caught a glimpse of the gun. Oh? He's certain it was a German Luger. Is that what makes you think it's Belmont? Oh, no, no, we have more than that. One of the men went back into the club. He and a girl went on the dance floor, threatened the orchestra leader with a gun, made him play loudly to cover up the noise of the safe being cracked. Oh, it was clever. From the description the orchestra leader gave us, the man who threatened him was Belmont. Had a girl working with him, too, huh? Evidently, yes. Now, Jim, I know this job doesn't come under your jurisdiction, We but... still want Belmont. Wait till I get some clothes on, Sergeant. I'd like to go back with you to that roadhouse. Evie, what time is it? Huh? What? I said, what time is it? Oh, it's almost 8 o'clock. Oh, are you sleeping? Uh-uh. Just dreaming. What do you mean? I was dreaming of that beautiful white bathtub back at the hotel. Oh. Jack, why'd we have to come back to this broken-down cabin? To meet Ray Nelson. Well, why couldn't he come to the hotel like he did before? Much better meeting him here. When's he coming? It's due at 8 o'clock. You gonna plan another job? Nope. Aren't you working with him anymore? No. Why not? Honey, I told you before. My plan of operation in this business is to profit by other guys' mistakes. So? 
so, the first thing I scratch is partners. They're liable to get nailed and talk. That's how other guys get trapped. Eventually, somebody working for them blows a whistle. Oh, you going to work alone now? Not necessarily. But I'm just picking one partner at a time. When we do the job, then I get another one. Yeah, but honey, aren't those ex-partners liable to talk? Not the way I'm handling it. What do you mean? You'll see. Yeah? Me, Jack. Right. Hi, Ray. Come on in. Oh, thanks. Hi, Mrs. Belmont. Hello. This is really a hideout you got here. Have any trouble finding it? Not with the directions you gave me. I'd hate to try to get out here on my own. Where's your car? Not at the foot of the hill. Uh, look, Jack, I can't stay very long, so let's cut up the dough, shall we? Ray, I'm afraid I got bad news for you. What? You ain't cutting in on that job. Huh? I'm keeping the whole thing. You mean you made me come all the way out here? The trip wasn't wasted. Wait a minute. Put that gun away. Sorry, Ray. Oh. Jack. That's how you handle ex-partners, baby. Now we'll take him down to the river, tie some weights on him, and he can have one of them baths you were beefing about. Body's right over here, Jim. When was he picked up? Early this morning. Uh -huh. He's moved right here to the morgue. This is it. Well, according to the coroner, he's been dead less than 48 hours. Uh -huh. Where was the body found? Near the municipal dock. Bullet wound in the temple. Yeah, he was obviously dead before he landed in the river. You say his name is Nelson? Yeah, Ray Nelson. How did you link him with Jack Belmont? Well, the bullet in his head was found to have been fired from a German Luger. Uh -huh. So we took a chance, called in the manager of that roadhouse, look at the body. And he identified him as the other man? Right. But Belmont evidently double-crossed his own partner. Looks that way. Find anything in his pockets? Yes, his possessions are right here. Anything of special interest? Oh, just this card of matches. Yeah. Thanks. Some writing on the inside flap. Uh -huh. Two traffic lights turn left. One traffic light turn right. Highway 9 and 7 tenths miles. Left 1 and 6 tenths miles. Cabin, top of hill. Right side of the road. What do you make of it, Jim? Did you find out where this man lives? Yeah, right here in the city. Well, Sergeant, it's possible these are directions to a place that Belmont is using as a hideout. Yeah. This man, Nelson, could have gone out there, been killed, and dumped in the river. But his body was found right here in town. Yes, I know. But there's a pretty swift current in the river this time of year. He could have been dumped in from any place upstream. Jim, if you're right, these directions should lead us right to him. No, I'm afraid it's not that easy. Oh? We don't know where Belmont was when he wrote these directions down. Oh. Sergeant, do you know if Nelson had a job of any kind? Yeah, he had a part-time job in a pool room. Well, then there are three places we know of where he could have been when he took down these directions. His home, the pool room, or the roadhouse. Right. Sergeant, why don't you call headquarters? Give them these directions. See if they'll send out squad cars from all three locations. Okay. Then we'll hop over there and wait for the results. Jim. Yes, Sergeant. First squad car's reported. One that left in Nelson's house? Yeah. Any luck? No, it led them to the state university. Well, we'll just have to wait for the next one. Here's a report on the second car, Jim. One that left in the pool room. Yeah, they drew a blank, too. What happened? Took them to the main street of Centerville. Just one more to go. I know. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Jim, our hunch didn't work out. Third car checked in? Yeah, they didn't find a thing either. Let's see those matches again. Here. You gave them the right direction, but I felt sure that... Hey, wait a minute. What? Why didn't I think of this before? Come on, Sergeant. This time we'll make the trip. Jack. Yeah, honey? Will you stop shooting? What's the matter, baby? I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand this place. Look, are you going to start that again? Why can't we leave? I told you we got to lay low till the heat's off. That's all we ever do. Now, wait a minute. 
We got 12000 on that last job, didn't we? Well, what good does it do us? What good is stealing money if we're going to spend the rest of our lives hiding out? Why can't we have fun with it? Evie, I told you, I'm running this show. Then you can keep it. What do you mean? I'm getting out. Now, look. I mean it. I'm sick and tired of Wait all Wait a minute. This. Look down the hill. What? There's a car parked down there. Where did it come from? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. There we are, Belmont. What? Put down that gun. Not a chance, mister. Oh. Jack! I've done some target practice myself, Belmont. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. How'd you get here? We got the directions from the pocket of a man named Nelson. He's dead. We found his body. The directions you gave him were written on this match cover. It's the place he called you from. Name is here on the matches. Joe's Bar and Grill. So you see, Belmont... You really let us hear yourself. Jack Belmont was turned over to the local authorities and convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to be executed. His wife, Eve Belmont, was sentenced to life imprisonment. This file was closed successfully by your FBI and the local police department of the city in which the crime occurred. In that respect, this case resembles many others. Cases on which your FBI worked long and hard, but on which they could not have been successful if it had not been for the cooperation of the local police department. Your FBI is very proud of its reputation, but it wishes to acknowledge now what it has repeated in the past. Your local police represent your first line of defense against crime. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sunshine Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sunshine Swindler, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
Has this ever happened in your home? You're sitting listening to the radio when... Hello? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? This is your FBI. Do you know who sponsors that program? Of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last week, I got my equitable representative to bring me that fact-facing chart for fathers they tell about on this program. And believe me, that chart's a real eye-opener. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all fathers full information about the Equitable Society's fact-facing chart that this father found so valuable. Tonight, FBI file, The Sunshine Swindlers. The criminal who commits a minor crime and who remains near the scene of his crime ordinarily is hunted only by a local police department. But the criminal who goes after bigger game, who regards the entire nation as his bailiwick, who commits a crime and then moves on, sometimes thousands of miles, presents a more difficult problem. The problem of finding one person in a nation of 140 million people. Every clue becomes an important one, for every clue might be the one which helps your FBI to bring the criminal to justice. But whatever the difficulties, however many times your FBI may have been frustrated, the search goes on. Because to stop would be to admit defeat and to leave the way open for the criminal to choose another victim. A victim who might be you. The night file opens in a house located on the shores of Miami's Biscayne Bay. In the living room of this residence, a woman is sipping a long, cool drink as a man enters. Hiya, Claire. Hello. What are you drinking? Rum and Coke. It tastes good? Mm-hmm. Looks good on you, too. What? <laughs> Look at the front of your dress. That's the dribble glass. I've been waiting two days to nail somebody with that. You stupid! I got Get you. Get out of here! I nailed you good. Get out! I said. Greetings, my dear children. I said greetings. Shut up, Claire. Look what that idiot just did to me. What happened? Another one of his practical jokes. Now, Charles, I've asked you. Oh, it was just the dribble glass. Dribble glass, itching powder, squirting flowers. That's all I get all day long around here. I'm fed up with it, see? Claire, control yourself. I'm fed up with this whole routine. Darling, please. For two weeks now, I've sat around this joint all day long while you've been out to racetrack, beach club, tea dances. Strictly business, my dear. Some business. Claire, if you... Could... I'd like to remind you that on the first of the month, we blow this house and two cars we've rented. Claire, listen to me. I've made a score. Huh? You mean you've met a dame? Yes. She's exactly the type we've been looking for. You telling the truth? Word of honor. Where'd you meet her? At the beach club. Her name is Reynolds. Grace Reynolds. Any dough? Loaded. What's the story on it? From the Middle West, 40-ish, a widow. Hey, that's right up your alley. Precisely. What about jewelry? She's practically illuminated. When do you see her again? We have a luncheon date at the beach tomorrow. Uh, let me have a pen and some paper. I want to write her a note. Here's a pen. Here's some paper. Thank you. Now... Uh, I shall tell her how long and difficult the hours will be until we meet again. I want her to... See, what's wrong with this pen? Rubber point. <laughs> now do you see what I mean? Oh, excuse me, are you Ralph Mitchell? That's right. Well, your agent in charge told me to see you. I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, hello there, Jim. Sit down. <laughs> Thanks. What brings you here to Miami? Well, I've been working on a case in Baltimore. I'll, I'll give you a brief outline on it. Okay, fire away. Well, a gang of jewel thieves have been operating up there. Two men and a woman. Uh-huh. The victim was a wealthy Baltimore widow. One of the men became friendly with her, took her out several times. He posed as a broker. 
What about the other two? Well, they were allegedly his secretary and his chauffeur. I see. Well, one night he took the victim out in his car, drove to a lonely spot, took her jewels, and left her there. Hmm. What are your leads? Well, they'd been living in a hotel in Baltimore. I learned that from the victim. But by the time I got there, naturally, they'd already checked out. I presume you have a description of them? Yes. Yes, we've sent out circulars. But you should have one down here by now. When did the robbery occur? Two weeks ago. Any of the jewelry turn up? Not yet. No. I gather you think the gang is down here. That's right. Why? Well, yesterday I finally established the fact that they'd bought plane tickets to Miami. I see. Am I to work with you on this case? Yes. Good, good. Any suggestions on our first move? Well, naturally, we should get the circulars to all the hotels, rooming houses, real estate agents. Right. And there's one other lead I'd like to follow up. What's that? Well, when I searched their Baltimore hotel room, I found a catalog they'd left behind from an outfit in Philadelphia called the Palisades Novelty Company. Yeah? They sell a complete line of practical jokes. Well... Now, as you know, practical jokers are incurable. Now, if one of the gang left that catalog, he might just turn up at a novelty store down here to replenish his supply. Yes. So let's get to work on that angle at once. Ah, Mrs. Reynolds. This is a glorious day. Glorious. Indeed it is. You know, I've just been thinking. Oh, what about? What a fortunate fellow I am. How do you mean? Oh, to have this beach, the warm sunshine, and above all, your charming companionship. Thank you. You know, Mrs. Reynolds... Oh, please, call me Grace. May I? Of course. Oh, thank you, my dear. I hope in turn that you'll call me... Richard. Very well, Richard. That's much better. <laughs> you know, Grace, I have a confession to make. What, Richard? If I'd followed my original plan, right now I'd be winging northward in a plane. Really? Yes. I had every intention of leaving this morning. What changed your plans? Would you really like to know? Yes. Meeting you. Oh, Richard. Are you pleased? Why, well, I... excuse me, Mr. Oh. Montgomery. What? Uh, oh, uh, hello, Miss Clare. I hate to disturb you, sir. Oh, that's quite all right. Uh, uh, Mrs. Reynolds, uh, this is my secretary, Miss Clare. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, what do you want, Miss Clare? Your New York office has been trying to reach oh, you. Oh, Baba. They said it's important. Tell them I don't wish to be disturbed. Yes, sir. What about Charles? Uh, where is he? Here, here at the club. He's waiting for you. Tell him I won't need the car this afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, how's the market? Steady. Good. Uh, that'll be all, Miss Clare. Yes. Goodness, I'm keeping you from your business, Richard. My dear Grace, the only business I have is to be with you. Ralph. Hello there, Jim. You're just in time. Oh, what do you mean? There's a teletype just came in for you. Huh? There you are. Thanks. Go into my office, Jim. Okay. Any luck today? Yes, picked up a lead. Don't know what good will do us, though. What'd you find? Well, I went the rounds of the novelty stores. I took these sketches that were drawn up from the descriptions we had of the three jewel thieves. Yes? A man in one of the stores recognized this fellow here. Well, that was the chauffeur. Mm, that's right. Uh-huh. He'd been in the store the day before, and he bought, of all things, some rubber handcuffs and a toy mouse. I see. He asked for a lot of other items, but they weren't in stock. Did he leave his name or where he lives? No. No, but I'm having the store put under surveillance just in case he does return. Well, Jim, that at least establishes the fact that they are here in Miami. That's right. Uh, what's in that teletype? Hmm? Oh, I asked Washington to check with the Palisades Novelty Company. Remember I found their catalog in that Baltimore hotel room? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I thought that if the catalog had been sent to someone in the hotel, we'd get a specimen of handwriting. But they had no record of any such request. You know, I don't understand why we haven't heard anything from the hotel and real estate people on that circular. No, I don't either. Ralph, if they're all down here, they're undoubtedly going to pull another job. We've got to catch up with them before they land the next victim. Claire? Oh, Claire. I'm in here. Oh. Hello, my dear. Hello. What's this? What? Uh, this broken vase. 
I threw it at Charlie. Unfortunately, I missed. Now, Claire. Look, I've taken all I can from that guy. This is the end. What did he do now? When I woke up this morning, my hands were clamped together with rubber handcuffs. When I went to brush my teeth, there was soap in the toothpaste. I drank coffee out of a dribble all cup. All right, all right, darling. We have more important things to discuss. Nothing can be more important. Now, listen to me. We're moving in on Mrs. Reynolds tonight. Hmm? So soon? My dear, I've had four days with her. With my technique, that's more than enough. What's the setup? We're going to work differently this time. I like it down here, and I think we'll stay a while. You mean after you take the jewels? Yes. How can you do that? I'm calling her now. Just listen, and you'll find out. I don't get it. Mrs. Reynolds' servants are off tonight. There'll be no one in the house. Yeah? Quiet. You'll hear the rest. Hello? Hello, my dear. Oh, Richard. How are you? Splendid, thank you. I just called to confirm our engagement for the evening. Oh, yes? I'll pick you up at about eight. That'll be fine. Uh, darling, do you by any chance have to be home early? No, of course not. Why? Well, I've dismissed my chauffeur for the evening. I thought after dinner we might take a ride in the moonlight. Just we two. Oh, uh, I'd love that. Fine. Oh, by the way, Grace. Yes? Uh, would you do me a favor? Oh, of course. What is it? Well, this may sound silly to you, but would you mind not wearing your jewels? Well, there's been so much talk of jewel thieves holding up cars lately. I'd just feel more comfortable if you'd leave them at home. Oh, very well, then. I will. Thank you. Oh, uh, have you a safe place to keep them? Yes, I have a strong box in my dresser drawer. Excellent. <laughs> Until eight, my love? Until eight. <gasps> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Claire, I have such a tickling in my nose. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me look in that phone. <laughs> I thought so. Uh, Look, sneezing powder. Charlie did that. Who else? That fool. He could have ruined everything. Why don't you get rid of him? I can't. We need him. We need him to get those jewels tonight. He's the best inside man in business. Do you need him after he gets the jewels? Oh, I see what you mean. Special Agent Mitchell. Hello, Ralph. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. I was hoping you'd call. Oh, what's up? A man named Hawkins got in touch with me a few minutes ago. He's a real estate agent here in Miami. Yes? He's been out fishing for a couple of days and just read our circular this afternoon. Oh, I see. He claims that he'd rented a house about three weeks ago to a man named Montgomery, huh? who answers to our jewel thieves' description. Well, did you get the address? Yes. Where are you now, Jim? At my hotel. I'll hop right over there and pick you up. <laughs> Me, Richard. Oh. Well, how did everything go? Okay. Have you got the jewels? Yeah. Well, where are they? Right there in that tin box. Oh, that's wonderful. The box is locked. You'll have to pry it open. That will be a pleasure. Now, uh, give me the details. Very uneventful. Charlie went in. I waited outside in the car. Ten minutes later, he's out with the box, and we drove back here. Wait until I get something to open this box. Where's the Reynolds dame? Oh, I just dropped her off at her house. Ah, this should do it. Did she enjoy the moonlight ride? No jealousy, darling. It was all in the line of duty. Uh, by the way, where's Charlie? He went out to put the car away. Oh. You gonna do like you said? Uh, about what? Taking care of that jerk. Uh, yes. When? A as soon as he comes in. I can hardly wait. Hey, what's that? The car pulling out of the driveway. Huh? Look! Look out the window! Why, Charlie, he's driving away. What in the Open world? Open that box, quick. What? Open it. Claire. Claire, surely you don't think... That's got that... it. Good <gasps> heavens. It's empty. Not quite empty. What is that? A rubber mouth. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. 
Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Had a hard day at the office, Father? You're pretty well relaxed now. Anything important can be put off till tomorrow. Well, here's one mighty important question that shouldn't wait. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That question is so important that you ought to have an answer based not on guesses or hunches, but on facts. The Equitable Life Assurance Society will help you get these facts. It has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Mr. Cross, that's something I really ought to know. Do you mind telling me where I can get this fact-facing chart and how much they charge for it? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sunshine Swindlers. There are times in the lives of all of us when we accept perfect strangers and give them places of confidence. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves how foolhardy such a course of action can be. For the criminal makes his living on the misplaced trust of his fellow men. Your FBI does not ask you as decent citizens to reject every offer of friendship made by a stranger. But your FBI does advise you to use an ounce of caution. To check a stranger's story before you believe it. Some strangers you meet are perfectly honest. Are indeed worthy of your every trust. But their honesty lies not in their faces. But in their hearts. Tonight's file continues. FBI Special Agents Taylor and Mitchell, acting on the tip given them by the local real estate man, drove to the jewel thieves' home. They parked their car and quietly circled the outside of the house. They are now returning to the front door. There's something funny here, Ralph. Lights are all on, but we didn't see anyone inside. I know. Garage is empty, too. Hey, do you suppose they were tipped off? Not by the real estate man. He's a reliable citizen. Hey, look there. What? Didn't notice that before. Front door is open. Yeah. Well, I guess we just walk right in. Let's go. Well, I'd say they've gone all right. We must have just missed them, Jim. Look. Huh? There's a cigarette in this ashtray. Yes. What have you got there? Something that proves we've come to the right place. What is it? A toy mouse. Huh? I just found it in this tin box. The practical joker. That's right. Someone's coming up the front walk. Yes. It's a woman. Richard! Richard! Ri oh, I beg your pardon. Is Mr. Montgomery here? No, I'm afraid he isn't. Well, uh, are you a friend of his? Not exactly. I've got to see him. Something awful has happened. Oh, what's that? Well, I, I was out with Mr. Montgomery this evening, and when I returned, I found that all of my jewels were stolen. Uh-oh. He advised me not to wear them, and I didn't, but when I got home... Uh, they... Just a minute, please. He was with you when they were stolen from your home? That's right. He used a new technique this time, though. Yes. What are you talking about? Oh, I beg your pardon. We're special agents of the FBI. What? We came here tonight to pick Mr. Montgomery up. He's wanted for jewel theft in Baltimore. What? Have you notified the police yet? Well, no. When I found they were gone, I came right here. Well, suppose you give us all the details, ma'am. Then we'll get on the phone and send out a general alarm. Please, Claire, I'm trying to think. We can't just keep driving around the streets of Miami. I know. We checked the airport and the railroad stations. 
I didn't think he'd abandon the car. But it's rented. So is this one, but it doesn't stop us from going wherever we please. Dirty double-crosser. How did he have brains enough to pull a trick like that? He undoubtedly overheard us talking about taking care of him, and... Uh, they wait a minute. What? I think I can guess where he's heading for. Really? Yes. Our Charles is a creature of habit. I'm sure that one cylinder mind of his will make him take the jewels to the one place that he's sure he can get rid of them. Where's that? Miller. The fence in New York. That could be. We're heading for Palm Beach. What for? To get a New York train. Well, they run from here, you know. Darling, our sudden disappearance may arouse suspicion. But if we take that much time, he may clear the jewels with Miller before we get there. It's too big a score. Miller won't handle everything in one chunk. So, darling, we play it safe and drive to Palm Beach. Pretty discouraging, Ralph. Yes. Two whole days now, and no trace of them. I know. You know, it doesn't seem probable that they would go into hiding here. They must have skipped town. In spite of our alerting airline, bus, and railroad terminals? Yes. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't have been more help to you, Jim. Oh, it wasn't your fault, Ralph. That's breaks of the game. If that real estate agent had given us that tip any sooner, we'd had the three of them behind bars. Uh, by the way, did you see these? Oh, what's that? Photostats I had made of the Beach Club guest registry. Hmm? All three of them signed in there, you know. Yeah, may I look at them? Huh? Sure, here. Thanks. We sent copies to Washington. They can check the handwriting. Something might come of that. I'd like a copy of these, Ralph. Sure. Might be very useful. Uh, when are you returning to your home office, Jim? Well, I'm supposed to report back tomorrow. But now that I have these handwriting specimens, I'm going to ask for permission to make a stopover in Philadelphia. <laughs> Now, don't get excited. The pattern worked out just as I knew it would. Miller bought less than half the jewels from him. Told him to come back next week. Did you find out where he's living? Yes, he's right here in New York. I have the address. Wait for me. I'll be right over to pick you up. Hello, Charles. <laughs> Greetings from Miami. Oh, what are you doing here? We found out where you were living. We decided to surprise you and drop in. Richard, never mind the small talk. Let's get down to business. Very well, my dear. Look, I... Uh, I bet you, you thought I ran out on you down in Miami, huh? You gave that impression. Well, it was just a joke. See, you know me. I'm all the time joking. This was your funniest. Well, now, Claire, you don't think I really tried to lamb off with them jewels. All we care about right now is the money you collected from Miller, plus the rest of the loot. Uh, sure, sure. I, I got it right here, all of it. Wait. Huh? I want you to observe I have a gun here, just in case you try anything irregular. Oh, now, look. Quit stalling. Get it up. Okay. Here's the, here's the money, and here's the rest of the jewels. Thank you. Now I have something for you. Oh! I see no reason for our staying around here, Claire. Did you get everything? It appears that way, yes. Okay, let's go. You see, darling, this proves the old adage, all's well that ends well. After you, my dear. I'd advise you to stay <laughs> right where you are. Who are you? What? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Richard. I have a gun here, so don't try anything. What are you doing here? I came to arrest that man on the floor. Finding you here was an added surprise. How'd you know where to find him? As you know, your friend there liked practical jokes. I learned that from a catalog he left in your Baltimore hotel room. So? So in Miami, I got specimens of his handwriting. I took it to the novelty company in Philadelphia and found out that he had written for another catalog from this address. Oh, that fool! Now, if you'll hold out your hands, please, I'd like to clamp on these handcuffs. Oh, and by the way, they're not made of rubber. <laughs> For their guilt in violating the National Stolen Property Act, 
Richard Montgomery and Charles Day were sentenced to serve a 10-year term in a federal penitentiary. Claire Montgomery received a sentence of seven years. For his complicity in the crime, the fence John Miller was imprisoned for five years. And thus was closed another case in the files of your FBI. Files that are as full as they are because last year there were almost one and a half million major crimes committed in this country. It is difficult for the human mind to understand the gigantic proportions of one and a half million major crimes. So perhaps it would be more helpful to break that figure down. To tell you that it's been slightly over 26 minutes since this program went on the air. And in that time, in that period of less than a half hour, there have been 74 major crimes committed somewhere in the United States. 74 more jobs for your local police, your state law enforcement officers, and for your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Bowtie Murders. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bowtie Murders on... This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.